Hey, I'm Shelley, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my history around racial injustice and healing, because I think storytelling is powerful, and I believe that more white people need to be talking about these issues, and more importantly, acting on them. I'm thinking recently about a protest that I was a part of back in college a long time ago that was very powerful, and about the connections between that protest and my thinking now. The protest was about something not overtly connected to racism. Uh, it was about a section of campus that had effectively become an unspace safe for the women on campus and about the women on campus taking, taking matters into their own hands and trying to create a better climate, a safer climate. And part of the protest included an open mic at which women were in, uh, encouraged to share stories from their own lives about their experiences on that campus. And the organizers made it very clear that if you were going to get up and talk, you needed to be speaking from your experience, you know, fr from that place. And I stood in the crowd and thought, I don't think I have any stories of, of a, a challenge that I faced in regards to my, my gender here and then, slowly but surely, I realized, oh, I have lots of stories to tell. I just had been in a situation where I'd been so strongly encouraged by the dominant culture to think of those stories as non-stories, as non-events, that it took some real work to get to the point where I recognized them as problematic and worthy of sharing. And I think that this is reflective of one of the biggest challenges for white people with regards to racism in this country is that the structures of racial privilege and white supremacy mean that white people every day get lots and lots of messages that say, you don't have to worry about this. It's not your problem. It's not really a problem. And even if it is a problem, it's not, it's not yours, right? Um, white privilege is working for me, and it has worked for me. And now that I'm consciously aware and paying more attention, it seems even more prevalent than I would have imagined before. So I think one of the big challenges with this work is just getting your head out of the place that tells you that the, the culture has built for you a very comfortable space in which you can sit and think, someone else will worry about this. Gee, that's too bad, but I'm sure it's not as big of a problem here because where I live is a, is a nice community full of nice people. Um, and whatever other internal monologues are going on to keep folks from thinking that this is our problem that, that we need to take on. And I think I still struggle with this. Honestly, I, I find myself on an almost daily basis having to push back against that little voice that says, you don't have to worry about this. This is not your problem. And I'm so grateful for the work of the folks who continually make it apparent and evident that it absolutely is my problem. And it's a luxury and a privilege for me to have any space at all in my life to think, I don't have to worry about this. That's part of privilege. And if, if I want to be a part of a more just and equal society, and I absolutely do, then I need to be part of the solution and not in the group of people who are thinking, oh, it's, it's fine, it's going to be fine, and look how much better it is now. I've been very grateful for the fact that my identity as an openly lesbian woman has meant that I have a, a little bit of a bridge of understanding that I can use to help me in this work. And what I mean by that is that I know from experience what it feels like to have my experience discounted and considered less worthy and less relevant uh, and less, less normal. So I can 
It's not the same. It's absolutely not the same. But I can use my experiences and my, my memories of those experiences to help me move into a space where I have, I hope, a little bit better understanding of what it is like to be an African American or a person of color in this country uh, it, it, as it relates to being in, constantly in a position of being one down and having a, uh, being in a situation in which you're considered less than. As a parent, I think one of the strongest motivations I have for engaging in conversations around race and trying to be a more active and dependable ally in this work is that I want for my son the kind of genuinely inclusive and supportive community that I don't think currently exists. And I know it's possible because I've had little glimpses of it. And I know what it can feel like if we all genuinely act as if everyone's life matters, that black lives matter, that we are all connected and that the common denominator of being human outweighs the, the, the constructed differences that we set up to, uh, to put white people in a position where they can count on good things coming their way on a regular basis. I have been the recipient of white privilege my entire life. From the books that were assigned to me to read in school to the fact that when I get pulled over for speeding, I can almost always talk my way out of the ticket. And this is unasked for. I didn't, I don't want it. I didn't ask for it, but there it is. And to the extent that I'm able to help break down the structures that belittle, demean, and discount the lives of people who didn't happen to be born white, then I feel like that's important work and it's work that I need to take on.